Well, good Wednesday evening, church family, and welcome to a time of worship and Bible study. Let me encourage you to get your song lyric sheets we sent earlier today and join along as we worship an awesome, incredible God this evening. All right, here we go. The heavens declare your glory And I will do the same the skies proclaim the work of your hands, and I will do the same. I will sing, I will shout, and glorify your name. All of creation testifies, and I will do the same. The mountains bow down before The trees of the field clap their hands, and I will do the same. I will sing, I will shout, and glorify your name. All of creation testifies, and I will do the same. I will sing, I will shout. tonight. Amen. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing the worth His wonderful love proclaim. Angels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Praise Him, praise Him, 
Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory under the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him. Tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him. Ever in joyful song. joy to 
right there where you are. Holy, holy, let every tongue proclaim, oh, Hosanna, joyfully we raise and lift to you our sacrifice of praise. Yes, we do. And live to you our sacrifice of praise. J. 
Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I'll never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon a rock, and now I know. for tuning in tonight. Pray that you've had a great Wednesday so far. Looking forward to opening God's Word together tonight. I want to encourage you to take your Bible and open, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11, we'll continue studying through this great Old Testament book of the Bible. Before, I, before we get started, let me just share with you that uh, at 7 o'clock tonight on Facebook, on our Southeast Baptist Church Muskogee Facebook page, I'll be hosting a live prayer meeting. So, encourage you to tune in for that. We emailed out to everyone we have an email list for earlier today, emailed out to you a prayer list of some things we'll be praying for specifically tonight. Much of that prayer list looks very similar and is exactly the same as we've had, uh, pr we've been praying for th those same things for the last several weeks. And then there are a couple of new things on there. And so I hope you'll take time to uh, download that and uh, you'll be praying with us not just tonight, but I pray that you'll be able to use that during uh, your prayer time with the Lord each and every day. And I want to encourage you during this time of pandemic, of social isolation, that you spend some time with the Lord. And so uh, really, we could see this time as a gift, 
uh, in that we get afforded an opportunity maybe to spend a little more time with Jesus than we may have had uh, had life been what uh, we've termed quote-unquote normal. So uh, be sure that you're taking the opportunity that we've been given to spend some time with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis, all right? Well, here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 11. We've seen Saul privately anointed as king by Samuel earlier in chapter 10. He's publicly announced as king in uh, the latter part of chapter 10. And we come to 1 Samuel chapter 11 and we see that Saul leads the nation of Israel in victory. If you're a fan of team sports and you've no doubt heard people give credit to one player or maybe to a head coach for leading his team or her team to victory. Well, in 1 Samuel 11, Israel's newly appointed king, Saul, is in his first official act going to lead them to victory. And so let's take a look here tonight in 1 Samuel chapter 11, and he leads them to victory because he finds that the people are in a, or at least one part of the nation is in an, in an area of crisis. And so let's look in verse 1 tonight here in 1 Samuel 11. The Bible says, Now Nahash the Ammonite came up and besieged Jabesh-Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, I will make it with you on this condition, that I will gouge out the right eye of every one of you, thus I will make it a reproach on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Let us alone for seven days, that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to deliver us, we will come out to you. So no sooner has Saul began his reign but that a distant but important part of his kingdom was attacked by the Ammonites. Jabesh-Gilead was a town that was east of the Jordan River. It was about 50 miles from Saul's home. The Ammonites, under the leadership of Nahash, have surrounded this city, and by doing so, they have made clear their demands. They expect Jabesh-Gilead to either surrender to them or be conquered by them. But that was the intent of Nahash and the Ammonites. The inhabitants of Jabesh initially attempt to handle this problem themselves. And they tell the Ammonites, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. And so they're trying to enter this agreement whereby they can keep from being overtaken, keep from being conquered, and, 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 and remain free uh, while maybe getting to pay a tax or something of that, that sort, they thought that maybe Nahash would demand some sort of financial remuneration or, or something from them. But they, they're in for a rude awakening. Because Nahash agrees to make a covenant with them, but the price for Jabesh was going to be the right eye of every one of their citizens. And so this was not financial remuneration. This was not oxen or cattle or livestock. He was demanding the right eye of every one of their citizens. Now, why in the world would Nahash make this kind of a demand on these people? Well, I believe there's two reasons. First of all, it was a tactic of humiliation. This facial disfigurement would have brought reproach on all of Israel, as they would have been able to be easily identified as, hey, there are those people that Nahash the Ammonite conquered, and he, uh, he took their right eye. He, they would have been easily identified for that. In, in turn, with his opponent being humiliated, Nahash is seeking to bring glory to himself. And so this was a tactic of humiliation, but it was also a tactic of handicap. Without their right eyes, the men of Jabesh-Gilead would be unable to fight effectively in battle. You can imagine how difficult it would be to uh, take on an opponent who's coming at you or opponents who are coming at you and only be able to see out of one eye. And remember that their combat here in this time was very different than combat at our time. They didn't have missiles that they would send. They didn't have guns in which they would fire from distance. Their battles would have been hand-to-hand -hand combats. And in hand-to-hand -hand combat, a man with one eye has less depth perception and he has left peripheral vision, which renders him pretty much useless in battle. 
And so this was a tactic of humiliation. It was a, it was a tactic of handicap that Nahash was suggesting to the people of Jabesh Gilead. Well, it's interesting that the name Nahash means serpent or snake. And really, we can look here and see that, boy, that's a fitting name for him. In what he desired to do to the people of Jabesh Gilead, he, he's acting like a snake, acting like a serpent. And we can see some similarities between Satan, our spiritual enemy, and Nahash, the enemy of Israel. And I want to show you four um, similarities that we see between Nahash and between our enemy. Well, Nahash wanted the he was intimidating the people, and Satan wants to intimidate us, and he wants to intimidate us for the purpose of getting us to serve him. Intimidate us in order to get us to serve him. And Satan works in this way in many different forms and fashions in seeking to intimidate God's people through difficulty. He seeks to intimidate God's people through persecution. In a myriad of different ways, he will seek to intimidate us and make us uh, or, or convince us, try to convince us to serve him. You think about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got him uh, and he's showing him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I'll give you all of this if you'll worship me. And he takes him to the pinnacle of a temple and says, throw yourself down because it's written, the angels will not allow you to dash your foot against the stone. What's Satan doing? He's trying to intimidate the Lord Jesus so that Jesus would serve him. And Satan works the same way in my life, same way in your life. He seeks to intimidate us in order to convince us of our need to serve him. But Satan not only wants to intimidate us, he wants to humiliate us. He wants to exalt himself over us. And you think about the temptation of Job. And, and Job is uh, he, he's one of the most well-respected, most renowned people in the land at that time. And he's got a family and he's got livestock and he's got livestock and he's got fields and he's got all of this. And in a in just a moment of time, he loses every bit of that. What was Satan trying to do to him? Humiliate him. He's trying to humiliate him. Exalt himself over him. And you know, friend, through humiliating one saint, Satan wants to bring reproach on all of God's people. Now, through the years... You know, at least in my lifetime through uh, the 80s and the 90s, we saw a lot of renowned, well-known Christian leaders who made bad decisions and fell morally. And as a result of that, it was not only humiliating to them, but also to the greater community of Christendom. And that's the way Satan operates if he can humiliate one, he can cause there to be a, uh, a black eye, if you will, on everybody who calls themselves Christian. And so one of the things Satan wants to do is humiliate us because in humiliating us, he can cause uh, a negative opinion upon Christianity itself. But a third thing Satan wants to do is to weaken us. He wants to take away our ability to effectively fight against him. And he does everything within his power in order to weaken us. Do you ever get uh, to that place where, where you're starting to pray and you just get discouraged and don't know um, that it's really worth your time and effort? Or maybe um, you just really don't have any uh, desire to sit down with God's Word and, and read God's Word and allow God to speak to you. Or, or maybe it's, you know, we're not in a time of, of social isolation and distancing and churches are congregating in their buildings. And, and uh, you, you know, you just you find other things to do because you, you don't really see the importance of being congregated with the people of God. Oh, what, what is all of that? It's Satan trying to weaken us. And Satan knows that if he can keep us from prayer, if he can keep us from the people of God, if he can keep us from the Word of God, then Satan knows that he can weaken us. He, he knows that he can effectively ruin our ability to fight against him. 
And so he just begins to strip us and he begins to weaken us of this ability to fight against him. You know, he does it in other ways. He causes roots of bitterness to creep up in our heart. He, he, he causes um, jealousy to begin to well up within us. And when our hearts begin to be full of anger and hate and jealousy and bitterness and greed and all of these other kinds of things, then all Satan is effectively doing is weakening us and he's taking away our ability to effectively fight against him. But a fourth thing Satan wants to do is he wants to blind us. And he especially wants to blind us to the truth. And if he can't blind us completely, he will blind us partially. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, uh, Paul talks about that the God of this world, speaking of Satan, that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. And Satan wants to blind us. He wants to blind us to the truth. And that's why he tries to keep us from God's word. It's why he tries to keep us from the house of God. It, it's why he tries to keep us from worship. It's, tr it's why he tries to keep us from uh, devotion. He wants to blind us to the truth. And another thing that we see him doing in this means by which he's trying to blind us is he tries to elevate falsehood. Elevate falsehood. And cause us to begin to follow into that, uh, in, into that falsehood pathway. Well, one of the things Satan wants to do in my life and in your life is he wants to blind us and especially wants to blind us to the truth because if he can blind us to the truth, he can keep us from him who is the truth and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he can blind us to the truth, then he can condemn our soul for eternity. And if he can blind us to the truth, he can keep you and I from living in abundant life. And if he can blind us to the truth, he can keep us from walking in freedom and cause us to walk in the bondage in which he binds us in. If, if, if Satan can keep us from the truth, then he can get his way in our life, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. And all four of these things we see, Satan, we, we see Satan doing in our life, we see Nahash doing in the lives of the Israelites. What, what did uh, you know, what does Satan try to do? He wants to intimidate us. What was Nahash doing? He was intimidating. Uh, what does Satan want to do? He wants to humiliate us. What was Nahash trying to do? He was trying to humiliate. Satan wants to weaken us. What was Nahash trying to do? He was trying to weaken the people of Israel. What does uh, Satan want to do? He wants to blind us. What was Nahash trying to do? He was trying to blind at least in part, of the people of Israel. And these, so these same four things that Nahash was trying to do to the people of Jabesh-Gilead, Satan's trying to do to you in 2020. He's trying to intimidate you. He's trying to weaken you. He's trying to humiliate you. He's trying to blind you. And he knows that if he can be successful in any or all of these things, that he can keep you from experiencing God's best in your life. Here are three tools that Satan uses to intimidate us, to humiliate us, to debilitate us, to blind us. Satan will use doubt to do that. He'll use doubt. Satan tries to undermine God's character, to undermine God's credibility because he wants you to doubt God. And we see this all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. What did Satan do when he came to Eve? He was seeking to cast doubt on God's character. He was seeking to cast doubt on God's credibility. He was seeking to cast doubt upon God's Word. Satan wants you to doubt God's Word and to doubt God's power. He wants you to doubt God's word, and he wants you to doubt God's power. I had a conversation just a couple of days ago with a gentleman who, who uh, Satan was at work, obviously in his life, and was bringing him to the place where he was beginning to doubt God's word and to doubt God's power to do exactly what God has said he wants to do. Satan was working, obviously, to bring this man to a place of doubt in his life. You and I are tempted to worry in difficult situations because we don't really believe God can, cause, God can solve our problem. Where does that come from? Where does that worry come from? Where does that fretting come from? Where does that anxiety come from? It comes from Satan causing us and, and tempting us to doubt God and to doubt God's power and to doubt God's ability to solve the problems that, he, that, that, uh, that come into our life. 
Sometimes we doubt God's grace and we doubt His mercy and we doubt His forgiveness and therefore we become burdened by feelings of anxiety and guilt. Sometimes people will say things like, you know, I know God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. No, no, that's really not the problem at all. It's not that you can't forgive yourself. It's that you can't embrace the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has already extended. It's not about what you are, whether you're able to forgive yourself. That's not even the point. The point is, can you and I trust God enough to do what He's promised to do? And that is, if we will confess our sin, that He would be faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So the problem is not that we need to forgive ourselves. The problem is we need to repent and confess. And when we do, we need to accept the forgiveness that God has already extended into our life. But sometimes we get burdened down with feelings of anxiety and guilt because we have a hard time believing that God could really forgive us for what we ask Him to forgive us for. And here's my question. If you doubt God can forgive you, why in the world would you even ask? The reality is this. God can forgive every single sin you and I can commit. His grace, the hymn writer said, is greater than all of our sin. The hymn writer said in there, Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there's flow in a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you can be today. Dear friend, just know this. There's not a single thing you can do, think, or say that uh, is incapable of being forgiven if you will just come to Jesus, repent of that, confess it to Him, and you can receive His forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross for all sin. He didn't die for most sin. He didn't die for some sin. He didn't die for the majority of sin. He died for all sin. And so we can embrace His forgiveness. We can, uh, we can receive His forgiveness because He's done everything necessary to provide it for us. Some people wonder if God really loves them, especially when bad things happen. Maybe there was a breakdown in the family. Maybe there was a loss of job. Maybe there was an illness that came. Maybe there was, um, you know, catastrophe that struck. But they begin to question, you know, does God really love me? If, this, if He could let this happen to me, does God really love me? And there's some of you, you may have been at that place at some point in your life. And you might be at that place right now. If God really loved me, why would He let this happen to me? Where does that kind of a thinking come from? Well, it comes from the devil who's trying to cause us to doubt God's love for us. And God has over and over and over and over again expressed His love for us. Romans 5, 8, God expressed, He demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's given us breath. God's given us life. God has given us so many different things, all of this being an expression of His love for us. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, challenging times come. Yes, yes, difficulties arise. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It means that we live in a fallen world. It means we live in an imperfect world. But this world is not home. We need to quit expecting earth to be heaven. This earth is not heaven. And it won't be until Jesus Christ decides to call us home, whether that be through death or through rapture that we'll be again to experience a perfect existence. But don't let the difficulties that come, don't let the challenges that arise, don't allow that to, to be an instrument that Satan would use to cause you to doubt God's love for you. God loves you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says that God is love. That's who He is. All of these things the enemy tries to do to get you to doubt God. But there's a second thing that he does trying to humiliate us or debilitate us or blind us or intimidate us. He uses persecution. 
He uses persecution. And persecution here in America, in large part, looks different than persecution in other parts of the world. But it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, Satan uses persecution. Satan uses difficulties. He, he wants to make things difficult for the Christian. I've seen several times through the years a young person coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they go home and they tell their parents about the decision they've made to give their life to Jesus. They've been forgiven of sin. They've received this gift of eternal life and there's no support from that family at home. In fact, they began to uh, persecute them. They began to tease them. They began to try and humiliate them for deciding that they want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We know uh, of our brothers and sisters around the world who are being drugged from their homes, who are being imprisoned, whose lives are being taken, who are being tortured, all because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Satan will use that kind of thing to uh, humiliate us. He'll, he'll use that kind of stuff to intimidate us that we might serve Him rather than our God. Multitudes of believers throughout church history have been tortured and killed for their faith. Multitudes are still being tortured and killed for their faith today. And Satan uses all forms of persecution to attack Christians. He'll use peer pressure in a, in a middle school or high school or in a workplace or a neighborhood. He, he'll use peer pressure in a, in a family. He, he'll use peer pressure however he can to try and get you to turn your back on the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan uses persecution. But here's a third thing he'll use, and that's self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Satan wants us to believe that we are self-sufficient. He wants us to believe that we can do it on our own, and therefore he urges us to trust in our own resources rather than in God. He wants us to trust our own resources. Well, last night we talked in our uh, dinner time devotion about not being a fool, and, and a fool is someone who trusts in their own heart rather than trusting in the Lord. And I talked some about this. Uh, idea that's out there, this philosophy that's out there, follow your heart. Well, where does that philosophy come from? It comes right out of the pits of hell. It's exactly where it comes from. Because our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God doesn't desire that we would follow our heart because He knows that our heart is tainted by sin. It's tainted by wickedness. It's, it's tainted by, by humanness. We don't need to follow our hearts. We need to follow Jesus. But Satan doesn't want us thinking that way. And you know what sounds really good to a person who uh, has no desire for God? Follow your heart. And there's millions of young people and even older people who have taken that counsel from the devil himself to follow their heart. And it's going to lead them to destruction. Satan blinds us to the truth of our need for Jesus by convincing us of our own merit and worthiness. It's pride. It's just pure de old pride. He, he blinds us to our need for Jesus by convincing us how worthy we are, of how meritorious we are. Look how good a person you are. Look how, how uh, kind that you are. Look how um, giving that you are. And he, and he points us to all of these things. And he does that because he wants, us to he wants to blind us to our need of Jesus. And he can blind us with pride and self-sufficiency and keep a person from following Christ. Now, it's, it's true God, Satan will blind somebody with their self-sufficiency and try to convince them that they don't need to be saved. They're too good and uh, they don't really need it. And then it's also true that on the flip side, he will convince people that, man, you're too bad. You're too bad to be saved. I've said this so many times, and it's not original with me, but I'll say it again. There's no one who is so good that they don't need to be saved. And there's no one so bad that they cannot be saved. And so we don't want to follow Satan's counsel here. We don't want to follow Satan's counsel anywhere, in fact. We don't want to fall into self-sufficiency. You see, Satan knows that when he can get us to see only how great we are, 
then we'll never truly see how fallen we are and how great Jesus really is. You know when, when Jesus becomes really magnificent and great and awesome to us? When we recognize just how desperately we need Him. Nahash has the men of Jabesh in a difficult spot. They've said, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. Nahash says, deal, we'll make a covenant. In terms of the, of the agreement are, I'm going to take the right eye of every one of your citizens. Well, instead of immediately rejecting Nahash's stipulations for making a covenant, they negotiate further. and They ask for additional time. They say, give us seven days to find a deliverer. And if after seven days we can't find anyone, they say, we will come out to you. In other words, we will surrender to you. In one way, the men of Jabesh Gilead are in a good place. Because they were certain of two things. Here are the two things. They were certain that they needed to be saved. And they knew that they could not save themselves. That's why they said give us seven days so that we can find someone to deliver us. They knew they needed to be saved. But they knew they couldn't save themselves. Many today even in the church. Many even who profess to be Christians don't know what the men of Jabesh Gilead knew. Many don't really know their need to be saved, rescued from the righteous judgment of God against their sin. You see, they are those that Satan has blinded through self-sufficiency, and and they don't believe that they really need to be saved because, after all, their life's too good. Their actions are too good. Their religion is too pristine. And many don't know their need to be saved because all they can see is how good they are. And many today do not know that they cannot save themselves. They still think in their heart of hearts they can do it. If they'll, if they'll just continue to stay faithful, if they'll just work a little harder, if, if they'll just try a, a little harder, that they can do it. They can save themselves. They can be sufficient. They can be good enough for God to let them into heaven. You see, many today don't know what the men of Jabesh Gilead knew. These men knew they couldn't save themselves, and they knew they needed to be saved. And one of the most important things you and I can know is that, first of all, we need to be saved. And second of all, that we can't save ourselves. Not knowing you need to be saved or thinking that you can save yourself are both tools that the devil uses to condemn people for eternity. And I want you to know tonight what the men of Jabesh Gilead knew. They knew that they needed to be saved. And they knew that they could not save themselves. It doesn't matter how good we are, how religious we are, how committed we are, how certain we are. If we don't know Jesus, we need to be saved. And Jesus is the only one who can save us. And I want to invite you at this very moment, if you have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and be your Savior and Lord, I want to invite you to do that. And we've got some uh, information here for you, a phone number that you can call or text, an email address that you can email. You contact us through one of these ways and say, I want to talk to someone about giving my life to Jesus. I want to talk to someone about being saved. And we'll follow up with you uh, as soon as possible and make sure that uh, you have the opportunity to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't fall for Satan's tactics. He tries to convince some they're too good, they don't need to be saved. He tries to convince others they're too bad, there's no way they could be saved. No tonight. Everyone needs to be saved. And no one is too bad to be saved. If you would ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, come into your life, be your Savior and Lord, 
then Jesus will save you tonight. We encourage you, invite you, and I even plead with you. Reach out to us and let us help you tonight. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you. I thank you for your blessings. And I pray for men and women who are listening to this, whom God, your Holy Spirit, is speaking to about their need to be saved. And I pray, God, that they tonight would reach out to us and give us the opportunity to tell them about the one who will save them. Give us the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. I thank you that Jesus came and that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross in our place, that he rose again from the dead, and that because of what he's done on our behalf, we can be forgiven and have eternal life. And I pray that there wouldn't be a single person listening to this right now who would not know for sure they've given their life to Christ. And if they haven't, I pray they'll reach out to us, Lord, and be saved. God, we love you, we bless you, and we praise you, and we give you glory and honor tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.